On January 17, 2014, authorities arrived at the residence of 52-year-old Hal Sasko, where they discovered his lifeless body. As the investigation unfolded, it was revealed that an 18-year-old woman had been living with him, a detail that shocked many as she was widely believed to be his stepdaughter. However, she was notably absent from the crime scene. When the full extent of what had transpired in the house came to light, the entire community was left in a state of shock. Sarah Gonzalez McLean was born on July 9, 1994. She grew up in the capital city of Kansas, USA. During her early years, she was homeschooled and never attended a traditional school. Sarah was a quiet and reserved girl, but also very kind-hearted and thoughtful. She had a younger brother with a disability whom she took care of and a close relationship with her older sister. When Sarah was still a child, a neighbor abused her, causing deep emotional trauma. This event had a lasting impact on her life. She began to experience recurring nightmares, reliving the abuse, and would wake up in the middle of the night, panicked and overwhelmed. The constant stress and anxiety prevented her from finding peace. Around this time, Sarah started sneaking out of the house and drinking alcohol to cope with her pain. Her concerned parents decided to seek help by sending her to a psychologist, hoping she could confront her trauma. However, things only worsened, especially at home. Around the same time, her parents went through a divorce, which deeply affected her. Sarah described her parents' divorce as the moment she felt completely unloved at home. Over time, she lost all contact with her father, and her relationship with her mother became increasingly strained. Feeling like she no longer belonged at home, Sarah sought to leave as soon as she could. At the age of 14, Sarah found a job at a local pizzeria. The owner, Harold Sasko, was a middle-aged man who, at first glance, seemed successful and trustworthy. At that time, he owned three pizzerias and was known to be a devout Christian. However, his employees had a different view of him. They often spoke about his inappropriate behavior. The manager of one of the locations mentioned that Harold Sasko instructed him to only hire young, attractive girls. He was uncomfortable with this and would often warn the new hires to be cautious around the owner. When Sarah joined the pizzeria and received this warning from the manager, she was still quite naive and thought he was exaggerating. As time passed, Harold began to interact more with Sarah, eventually gaining her trust. He would pick her up from school, drive her to work, buy her gifts, and even encouraged her to confide in him, asking her to think of him as a father figure. However, Harold also instructed Sarah not to tell her mother what was happening. She obeyed, and her family never found out about their relationship. Alongside her connection with Harold, whom she began to view as a father figure, Sarah experienced another traumatic event at the age of 16. This time, it involved a close friend. According to her, they were on vacation together when he pushed her onto a table, breaking it in the process. He then assaulted her and even burned her back with a cigarette. This incident deeply affected Sarah, who was already working through her childhood trauma in therapy. The memories of her past abuse came rushing back. Sarah returned to therapy, 
and this time she was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Things spiraled quickly. The stress and depression intensified to the point where she attempted to take her own life. As a result, Sarah was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for some time. There, she received therapy and was prescribed medication to aid her recovery. After being discharged, Sarah continued taking her medication and attended therapy sessions regularly. This support once again began to help her heal from her experiences. However, the situation at home remained highly stressful, and Sarah found it unbearable to stay there. By the time Sarah was hospitalized, she was no longer working at Harold's Pizzeria, but they had maintained contact. He would still pick her up from school, take her out for lunch, and ask her about her life. Being 50 years old, Harold saw an opportunity when Sarah was vulnerable and decided to exploit it. During this time, he repeatedly suggested that she move in with him. He was single, childless, and lived alone with a successful business that was thriving. He told Sarah he could help her financially and even offered to pay for her college tuition. Despite being desperate to leave her turbulent home life due to the frequent, violent conflicts with her mother, Sarah repeatedly declined his offer. But in 2012, after graduating high school and turning 17, she finally accepted and moved in with Harold Sasko. At that point, it seemed like a fresh start. She believed that living with him would provide her with everything she needed. And in the beginning, that was the case. Harold bought her everything she required, enrolled her in college, provided her with a place to live, and didn't ask for anything in return. He showered her with gifts and was attentive to her needs and desires. Everything changed once Sarah turned 18. At that point, Harold began making inappropriate suggestions. He proposed that she enter into a romantic relationship with him in exchange for all the support he had given her. Naturally, Sarah refused. Throughout the months she had lived with him, they had pretended to have a stepfather-stepdaughter relationship to avoid any misunderstandings or suspicions. Sarah had never imagined that he would ask for such a thing. According to her mother, she had always disapproved of Sarah moving in with Harold, but Sarah had never listened. Many people close to them said that Sarah even called him Dad, which made his request all the more shocking. When Sarah refused, Harold became furious. He made it clear that if she didn't comply with his demands, she would no longer have a home or any support. Harold also knew about Sarah's history of substance abuse and that she had started drinking and using illegal substances at a young age. He exploited this by offering her drugs. Under the influence, Harold attempted to take advantage of her and on several occasions, he succeeded. Each time Sarah refused, he grew angrier, more aggressive, and violent. Harold eventually handed Sarah a list of all the things he had purchased for her and claimed that until she paid him back in full, she wouldn't be allowed to leave. He manipulated her, threatening to sue her for non-payment if she tried to escape. By this time, Sarah had secured a stable job, but earning minimum wage, she couldn't meet Harold's financial demands. Among the debts were two expensive cosmetic surgeries that Sarah had undergone at his urging. One was a rhinoplasty, and the other was a buttock implant. The second surgery caused her so much pain that she had to take medication for months afterward. Harold demanded $16,000 from Sarah. In addition to these debts, he also insisted that she pay him rent for the time she had lived with him. Sarah felt she had no way out. She couldn't return to her mother's home, as Harold had psychologically manipulated her into believing that no one wanted her back and that she wouldn't be accepted there. Her behavior changed drastically. Sarah was no longer the quiet, kind-hearted girl she once was. She became aggressive, 
avoided talking to anyone, and would lash out at the slightest remark. According to Sarah, her thoughts gradually shifted and she started to feel an urge to harm others. Her first step was visiting a pet store where she bought rabbits. Once home, she killed them with a knife, skinned them, and then ate them. Harold witnessed the entire event but said nothing. In fact, he laughed at her actions. If Sarah wasn't at work, she was at home with Harold, often under the influence of drugs or alcohol and in a foul mood because of everything she had gone through. At one point, she began taking antidepressants, hoping they would help. Weeks passed, but they had no effect. She then switched to stronger medication, but those didn't help either. Eventually, Sarah spiraled into a self-destructive path, and it was only a matter of time before something tragic occurred. On January 17, 2014, police officers arrived at Harold's house. His co-workers had reported him missing after he failed to show up at the pizzeria for several days, and they had been unable to reach him. The officers knocked on the door multiple times but got no response. They then looked through the windows to see if they could spot anything, and one of them saw the body of a man lying in a pool of blood. The officers broke down the door to enter the house. Inside, they found several empty beer cans next to the body. Harold's body was taken to the coroner's office for examination, and it was determined that he had died from multiple stab wounds to the neck. Additionally, an analysis of the beer cans revealed traces of sedative pills. The police knew that Sarah had been living in the house with Harold, and when they found her phone, they initially thought she might have been abducted. Her age made them think she could have been taken against her will. Investigators later learned that Sarah had called into her workplace, informing them that she would be absent for a few days due to the death of a relative. They spoke with her family, and her mother mentioned that Sarah had been trying to reach her grandmother. The police traced the calls to various payphones located at convenience stores. Reviewing the security footage from these stores confirmed that Sarah was the one making the calls, and she was traveling alone from Kansas to Texas. With this information, the authorities realized Sarah hadn't been kidnapped and she became the prime suspect in Harold's murder. On January 25, 2014, 11 days after the murder, 19-year-old Sarah was found by park rangers sleeping in Harold's car in the Everglades National Park. Around 10.30 p.m., the rangers woke her up to arrest her and discovered she had a loaded gun. A search of the car revealed another firearm, drugs, a hatchet, and two knives. When arrested, Sarah wasn't immediately taken back to Kansas. Instead, she remained in Florida for questioning by several investigators. She offered no resistance and didn't try to fabricate any stories. Sarah quickly confessed to killing Harold and fleeing the scene. She explained that he had been harassing her for a long time, and she saw this as her only way to escape. Sarah detailed the events leading up to the crime. A few days before the murder, when Harold wasn't home, she went to a pharmacy and bought a packet of sleeping pills. On January 14th, three days before his body was found, Harold had the day off and was doing some repairs around the house. He asked Sarah to bring him a beer. That's when Sarah realized this was her opportunity. She knew that Harold wouldn't stop at just one beer, but would keep asking for more. After the third beer, Sarah started slipping sleeping pills into his drink. She explained that she waited until the third can to avoid him noticing any strange taste. As he continued to drink, she kept adding more pills, and according to the police, she gave him a total of five. The combination of alcohol and sedatives caused Harold to lose consciousness. Sarah then quickly tied his hands and feet. At one point, she said, he woke up for about a minute and mumbled something. Sarah didn't quite understand him, but said she felt a moment of pity for him. However, she was determined to go through with her plan. She pulled out a knife and stabbed him multiple times in the neck, 
nearly decapitating him. After realizing he was dead, Sarah used his blood to write the word freedom on the bathroom wall. She then washed her hands, took a shower, and changed her clothes. Before leaving, she took money, a tablet, and Harold's car keys. Sarah left her phone behind, believing the police would track it and think something had also happened to her. She drove toward Texas but didn't like it there because it was too cold at night, so she continued her journey to Florida. Most of the time, Sarah slept in the car, stopping occasionally to rest along the road. Upon arriving in Florida, Sarah visited a local tattoo artist named James Baker to get a new tattoo. It wasn't her first. She already had the phrase, Only God Can Judge Me, inked on her shoulder. For her second tattoo, Sarah chose a quote from a book, The descent into the dark well at the bottom of our heart. In its cold, black depths, twisted and strange creatures dwell, best left undisturbed. Sarah had hoped that by cooperating with the police and sharing her story of abuse at the hands of Harold, they would show leniency and commute her sentence. However, this was not the case. The authorities painted Sarah as a true psychopath, while portraying Harold as a peaceful Catholic man who had only wanted to help her. At one point during her interrogation, Sarah admitted to one of the officers that, during her fits of rage at Harold's house, she felt the urge to kill. The prosecution argued that Sarah had killed Harold simply because she wanted to know what it felt like to kill a man, not because he had been violent with her. A key piece of evidence found on Sarah's phone was a message from Harold apologizing for forcing her into a sexual relationship with him. However, this crucial information was not presented to the jury during her first trial, and all evidence of Harold's abuse towards Sarah was disregarded in the pursuit of justice. In February 2014, Sarah's trial began. Her attorney chose not to use the history of abuse as part of her defense, especially since the prosecution had chosen to ignore it. Instead, the defense team pursued a risky strategy, claiming Sarah suffered from dissociative identity disorder. They argued that Sarah had developed multiple alter egos to cope with the trauma she endured. However, this defense strategy failed to convince anyone. Neither the judge nor the jury believed the defense's claims. The prosecution presented a completely different narrative, focusing on the idea that Sarah had killed Harold purely to satisfy her curiosity about killing. They argued that the sexual relationship, while pressured by Harold, was consensual and unrelated to any form of violence. Moreover, the prosecution contended that the drugs found in the house had been purchased by Sarah, not provided by Harold even though there was little concrete evidence to support this claim. The prosecution further asserted that Sarah had planned the murder in advance. Her phone contained several messages to her sister, suggesting that she had already devised a way to permanently get rid of Harold. Based on this, they argued that the crime was premeditated, requesting a first-degree murder conviction. Supporting this, Investigators found Sarah had spent a month researching vulnerable areas of the human neck and methods of attack. On September 4, 2015, Sarah, who was 21 at the time, was found guilty of first-degree murder with premeditation. She was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 50 years. After the trial, the media uncovered much of the evidence regarding Harold's abuse and the testimony that had been withheld from the jury. It became clear that a significant portion of the truth about Sarah and Harold's relationship had been kept from the court. The reasons for this remain unclear, whether it was to preserve Harold's image as a quiet, religious man, or if the prosecution was simply determined to secure the harshest possible sentence for Sarah. This revelation drew widespread public attention to the case. In 2021, Sarah reached a plea agreement with the prosecutor, 
resulting in her sentence being reduced from 50 years to 25 years. Although she is still serving a life sentence, she will be eligible for parole after 25 years. Thanks for tuning in to Unreal True Crime. If you're intrigued by mysteries from around the world, check out our new channel, Latin Crimes, where we dive into the gripping true crime stories of Latin America. Don't miss out. Subscribe now for more thrilling investigations.